we have a functioning microphone. Great. All right, let's start again. Welcome. We're thrilled to be here. Um, uh, this is the fourth hearing now of, of the Colorado Commission on Affordable Health Care. We've been to Alamosa and Colorado Springs. Last night we were at Grand Junction, and today, of course, we're here. Um, our charge is to go to all seven congressional districts um, and try to listen to what you have to say about um, what's driving health care costs so that that can inform our process of getting to recommendations to make to the General Assembly about what Colorado may do to control cost of health care. We're very aware of the problems that you've been experiencing in Summit County. It's something that has been brought to our attention multiple times and many of us already work in the public policy arena and have heard um, about what's happening here for years now. Um, and, uh, and so I wanted to start with that. Um, we have, the way today is gonna work is that um, we have a PowerPoint presentation, so we're gonna start just giving you an overview of the commission and our charge, um, introducing ourselves to you. And then we wanna hear from you. This session really is about us listening to what you have to say. We may ask you questions from time to time as you talk about what the problems are that are facing you, any solutions that you think are worthwhile um, talking about and that we should consider, or anything unique um, in Summit County, both in terms of the problems that you're facing or in terms of the solutions that you've tried to create to address those problems with healthcare costs. So with that, um, I'm gonna get started. Um, I'm gonna start by introducing folks on the panel. If you could move the slide forward one. Um, but first I'm gonna talk about the legislative charge. So the Colorado General Assembly two years ago um, set up the commission um, and, uh, and did it in order to try uh, to begin to address what they know, and I think all of us know, are the problems of increasing costs of health care in the state of Colorado. Our charge, as you can see, um, is to focus our recommendations on evidence-based cost control, access, and quality improvement initiatives, and the cost-effective expenditure of limited state dollars. Um, we have been, as Cindy will walk you through, um, we have been working on this for two years now, have submitted one interim report um, so far to the Colorado General Assembly, and we'll submit two more reports over the next year and a half. Um, we're supposed to be really examining um, what it is that drives sort of the fundamental, the principal drivers of healthcare costs. Um, and so while there are lots of things that, con that contribute to affordability issues, what it is that's actually driving costs up is something that um, Colorado hasn't spent a lot of time focusing on, and this commission has really been trying to get our arms around that. Um, so I'm gonna let Cindy walk you through sort of what exactly we're doing. If you can move to the next slide. And the next slide. New driver. New driver, okay. So I'm gonna introduce you. I'm just gonna go down, uh, go down the row here. Um, Alicia Caldwell. Um, is here, she's the de Deputy Executive Director of the Department of Human Services. She's an ex officio member of the commission. Um, Marcy Morrison is a former legislator um, and a former commissioner of insurance. Um, she represent, She comes from Colorado Springs and she represents consumers on the commission. Um, Tracy Campbell, also an ex, ex officio member of the commission. Um, is here to represent the Center for Improving Value in Healthcare. Um, you may know about the All Payer Claims Database. That's administered by the um, Center for Improving Value in Healthcare, and that's been an amazing tool to try to get at the issues of healthcare costs in the state of Colorado. Um, Cindy Sobein Miller uh, represents business interests on the commission. Um, she's a uh, somebody who works uh, extensively at the Capitol in terms of promoting business interests in the healthcare um, world. Um, I'm Elizabeth Arnelas. I'm the uh, Director of Health Policy at the Colorado Center on Law and Policy. I represent consumers on the commission as well. Ira Gorman represents non-physician providers on the commission. He's a professor at Regis University um, and teaches uh, physical therapy. Um, Jeff Kane is a physician, Dr. Kane, um, and uh, he represents physician providers on the commission, has an extensive background both on the public si policy side of healthcare and on the delivery system side of healthcare. Um, Greg Argonne is a hospital administrator um, representing hospitals on the commission. Um, and Linda Gorman 
um, is the uh, director of health policy at the Independence Institute, a uh, conservative think tank um, working out of Denver, Colorado. So that's our commission, and um, I think if you could turn to the next slide. Just to kick off, just a little bit of background. This is not something we need to spend a lot of time on. As we start these presentations, we want to start with a focus on the driving, what's driving the cost of health care and the rise in cost of care. So uh, there have been many articles over the last couple of years, both in the New York Times, the one that talked about how this was the highest cost region um, in the country for health care costs. Um, here's a Wall Street Journal article, next slide. Um, Grand Junction, uh, among the most expensive places in the country. Um, and so with that, I think I'm going to turn this over to Cindy and let her go into the presentation. And I will hold this and she will hold that. Let me see if I can undercomplicate this a little bit. Here we go. Stereo. All right. Thank you so much for the turnout today. It is so great to be in your beautiful community out of the metro area and enjoying the weather that you have down here. And uh, thank you for allowing us to come and visit with you. My name is Cindy Sovine Miller. My name is Cindy Sovide Miller, and as uh, Elizabeth indicated, I was appointed to represent employers, small employers specifically, who are paying for group health insurance and the implications of um, the costs that, that continue to increase every year on their ability to continue to do that and operate um, in the way that they choose to see their businesses move forward. Um, I was elected by my peers to be vice chair of this group. Our chair, Bill Lindsay, is really sad he was not able to join you today. He is uh, celebrating his daughter graduating from residency. I don't know if you graduate, but there, that happened. And so he had to go be with her and, and was not able to come and join and be here with all of you. But I know that, uh, that he really wanted to, wanted to be here and appreciates all that you're doing. Um, as Elizabeth said, we've spent the last couple of years uh, really trying to, if you go to the next slide, to, to have a conversation about what do we do with the rising cost of health care in this state, in our country, what do we do as a state, what do we have control over. One of the things that we got hung up on right off the bat is, is defining what cost actually is. Is it, is it price, is it cost, is it spending, and so we took a little bit of time setting a foundation around um, defining costs and uh, ultimately, you know, labor, equipment, facilities, administration, what is required to deliver the services, the total supplier's cost. The price is what the provider is, of course, paid for that service. And then spending is the total amount, the utilization, what we have, how much we are spending for that service. And so we really had to try to embark on a common understanding of what cost was, how we were spending our money. and and um, looking at, at ways to make changes to that. Next slide, please. The phases of work, we are two years in. Our, our final scope of our final report with recommendations the legislature wrote is not due until June of 2017. So that will, um, that we are in, in a huge scope of work right now. And of course, all of us feeling the push of what's going on, the rates, everything that's happening that were just increased. We're, we're there, but when you look at our phase of work, when we were set out in statute, we are, we are now in the evaluation phase. We are completing the last part of our, our evaluation phase with these statewide meetings, and then moving into the recommendation phase. So I'm really hopeful that you didn't come here expecting to hear solutions from us today. We are not there yet. In fact, the most valuable thing that we have done as a commission, in my opinion, is get out on the road and come in to listen to you. Because in Denver, it's very politically correct often, I feel, the conversation in some ways. And so we've heard real stories about how this is impacting your business, you as individuals, you as employers. And we've really been forced to take a look at what all of this is happening. And it's, it's charged within us to, to look at the status quo and, and, and think about what changes really need to be made in order to make this system something that's sustainable and workable for all of us. And so we're really, again, appreciative of you coming forward. Go to the next slide, please. This is a kind of a framework in terms of when we think about how many different things need to be done what, what, what recommendations can we put forth to the Colorado State General Assembly that they are able to take and, and make actionable? And in doing that, of those things, what can we put forward that's actually going to be data-driven to suggest that we're going to receive a return on investment for moving forward with this policy so that we are not 
pushing forward ideas that are creating unintended consequences and unfunded mandates on all of you that only exacerbate the problem without putting a return on that investment. So we've all really tried to take this time to learn and educate ourselves and, and take a very measured approach toward putting together some quality recommendations for the legislature to review. We want to make sure that the uh, impact is measured or and that we've talked about what that is to both the public sector and the private sector. Again, putting forward it, create, you know, things that require technology changes or administrative changes all have a cost implication to them and, and what is the evidence out there that shows that, uh, that we're going to make a, a good decision with that growing future costs, and then of course, can it be measured and evaluated? What can we do to ensure that the legislature can see that there is that return on investment? You can go to the next slide, please. So from an areas of analysis standpoint, this is, this is the area where we, these are the issues that we've been spending most of our time up to this point working on. Um, a lot of them seem very linear, because transparency, you know, it turns out that there's, there's areas in workforce where transparency could be a tool and there's areas in uh, regulatory costs and administrative costs. And so we, t we talk about transparency almost every single meeting. And uh, we talk about, we've talked a lot about workforce, the shortages that we're facing, the issues that we're facing with providers, both in public insurance programs and in private insurance programs and the interactions there. Social determinants, what are our local communities facing that are creating both um, issues and potential that we can look at, uh, regulatory costs, administrative costs, payment and delivery reform mechanisms. Are, are we paying for healthcare in the right way? Are we maximizing our dollars and receiving the value that we need to? And if not, what other ways can we be looking at to ensure that we do that? Market competitiveness, we've heard a lot about this one um, in our statewide meetings, technology. Technology can be a really useful tool. It can also be a really expensive tool, and if it doesn't talk to the other systems, create a lot of problems and unintended consequences. And so looking at the systems that we have in place now and the systems that we need to have in place in order to have a successful system, those are issues. And then pharmacy and hospital costs. Um, that's actually just, if you go to the next slide, a, a pretty good lead in, into where we are at. This is a snapshot of Colorado's health spending by service type. And it's already old, it's 2013, but it is the most accurate picture of what we can show you to demonstrate what we're spending our money on in this state. And this data, I say it's already old, it is, because we've seen pretty significant shifts in uh, prescription drug spending and other costs that are increasing just in the last couple of years alone that are, are changing this dynamic. So um, you can go to the next slide. Um, this, is, this is just a slide to kind of give you a little bit of historical context on where we are at as a state in terms of coverage. And I, I look at this slide, this was put together um, from the uh, Health Access Survey, is that correct, Michelle? The Colorado Health Access Survey done by the Colorado Health Institute and they have great data. They put together this slide that really kind of demonstrates what, what has happened in our state. And what you will see is that we, um, increased the overall number of people that had coverage, but there were decreases both in employer and individual coverage in private insurance, and those increases were made up in the public insurance programs. And so we've heard a lot of, of different conversation about that. Um, before I try to lead you in too, too far into to some of my thoughts, what I'd like to do now, because again, as I said, this has been the most valuable part of the work I believe we've done up to this point, is we have heard from these communities and we really, really have taken away some valuable feedback, some great ideas, some things that we think we need to take and see if they will work and it has really expanded our thought process and helped us to better think about what we need to do with the time that we have left on our commission and how we can best help you. So um, I thought we'd kick off public comment by maybe starting your state representative, Millie Hamner, for this area. I saw that you were here. I thought maybe I'd tap on you and see if maybe you'd want to say a few words about your experience in Denver and connecting the dots on some of the things you've heard today. Well, thank you, Cindy. I just want to start by thanking all of you um, members of the commission for your hard work and for choosing to host the meeting in Frisco, which makes it a little more convenient for many of us to attend. Um, I am a member of the Budget Committee, and as you know, there were decisions we had to make about continued funding as a commission. And I've always voted for funding for the commission. I think you're doing a great job. 
and um, you know, the potential outcome might be huge. So I said, I think the board supported it uh, with budget decisions to this year. And then to all of you who chose to be here today, thank you. The fact that we have so many people here today is indicative of how big this issue is. And I would say, if I were to identify the top issue I've heard from my constituents, it's this. Uh, so this year I did carry legislation um, with Representative Rankin from Garfield County and Senator Donovan from Vail. And many of you, I see Alice from Leadville, and I came down to the Capitol to testify. Um, we heard hours of testimony from people who live on the Western Slope about this very issue, um, how unaffordable and how unfair the current practice is uh, for insurance for health care. And we heard stories from individuals, I bet some of you in this room have some of those same stories, of paying inordinate amounts of money for the same exact coverage that people in Denver <coughs> pay significantly less for. The exact same coverage, the same income levels. I see some of you nodding your heads. And so the bill that we passed this year with bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate uh, in Colorado is looking at the feasibility of having one geographic rating for insurance purposes in Colorado. And we have charged the Division of Insurance to study that issue and make a recommendation to the Budget Committee by August 1st. So as a member of the committee, I'll get that report and I'll look at the feasibility of what that report is telling us. So I don't want to take the time. Um, the purpose of this meeting is to hear from you. And again, thank you to the Commission for hosting the meeting here and all of you for taking the time. I'm Johanna Gibbs, I work for the Keystone Policy Center, and we staff the commission's work as well as- We can't the hear you. We can't hear you at all. Okay. It's just mumble. Everybody. I'm, everybody, we'll just use our inside, outside, children voices. So I'm Johanna Gibbs, I live in Breckenridge, Colorado. I work for the Keystone Policy Center, and this is my colleague, Julie. She's gonna be capturing um, our discussion today. We staff um, the commission's work, and so we've been um, going around the state with with them. Um, the Colorado Health Institute is our data partner for this process and the efforts of the commission. And so we just want to spend the rest of our time today um, hearing from you all um, and having the commissioners, they may have some questions for you, um, comments. And so in Summit County style, it'll be informal. Just give me a wave, let me know where, and uh, we'll start a queue for comments. Um, and uh, we'll just kick it off. Anybody want to start? Okay, great. Use your inside voice or outside voice, kid okay. voice, loud voice, whatever. I have a question for the hospital administrator. And, yes, sir. Uh, from my um, viewpoint, I sell health insurance, so I'm around the whole state. And I, I want to know why the competition in the hospitals is to see who can charge the highest price. That's what I see. I don't, the competition that I see in the hospitals this nonprofit down in Salida is the most expensive hospital maybe in the entire country. All these hospital administrators want to see who can charge the highest price. Why? Can you tell us your name, please? Michael Hornback. I'm a hospital chief financial officer in uh, Denver. I'm a hospital <laughs> chief financial officer in Denver, so I'm not familiar with what's happening in Salida. I can't really speak to that. Um, I, you know, one thing I would propose is that um, some, some things come down to basic supply and demand. And I don't know how many hospitals there are in Salida, but if there's only one, you can charge as much as you want, wow. so to speak. That? I mean, that's what they're doing. They're charging just as much as they want. It's, a, it's, an, inelastic, it's an inelastic service, and they don't have to accept managed care um, pricing and that sort of thing. Um, whereas in Denver, there's a lot of hospitals, a lot of competition. No one's in a position to up their rates substantially or manage care payer wouldn't opt to contract with them. Um, for Medicare and Medicaid, as you know, with some variation, most payments throughout the state are at least are within a similar bandwidth. So we're basically talking about managed care companies. Well, and when the managed care companies come in, you guys just raise your rates. 
Yeah, there's, I, I can't speak to what the managed care company There's a real problem. I, can't, I, I don't control what the managed care company is. Is there anybody on this board that's from rural health care at all? So the person on this board from rural health care, uh, Steve Erkenbrock, um, who runs Rocky Mountain Health Plan, uh, and who lives in Grand Junction, is on this panel. Marguerite Salazar. But they're not here. They're not here today. Okay. Yeah. Sarah, it looks like you have a question. I was just curious, but I'm Sarah Van, I'm the CEO of the local federally qualified health center here. And I was wondering if you looked, when you looked at the areas that have the highest cost, has there been a, a check in terms of what the margins look like for providers and hospitals? So if the cost is higher to provide the health care and, and everybody has to charge more to cover that cost, you would expect that margins would be similar. Is that part of the analysis that you all are looking at? In other words, does it really require that it costs that much and, and that the prices be inflated? Uh, Higher cost would typically higher cost that a patient is charged or an insurance company is charged by a provider would typically lead you to believe there would be higher reimbursements for that provider. Unless, and this is oftentimes the fact, that that provider or hospital is more inefficient than the rest of the competition. But does anyone look at that piece of it? Are the, are the more expensive areas more profitable for the healthcare entities or less profitable or it's not, there's not a connection? Just curious. Um, I, I, I can add one thing. Um, what, if you look nationwide and you're looking at which hospitals are closing and where new hospitals are being built, one of the biggest problems, um, and I, I'm an economist, that's my role on this, is, is, is that in areas where most of you are being paid by Medicare and Medicaid, where the prices are fairly fixed, those are the places where hospitals are having the most trouble. Um, part of it is because, you know, government's setting prices and they don't necessarily get it right. And part of it is, some of it's economies of scale. If you're buying a big piece of diagnostic equipment and you're only spreading it over 10,000 people, each person's going to have to pay a little bit more than if you're spreading it over 200,000 people and you can run it 24 hours a day. Other issues are it's more expensive to be a specialist in a remote area. You have to spend a lot on travel time, training, and so forth. You don't have as many colleagues. You may be on call all the time. So, so it is very different in rural areas than urban areas. And some of it you can maybe talk about, and some of it is just not fixable because gasoline is more expensive. A lot of things are more expensive. Right, and I, I know, I understand. But the efficiency piece is a big, important right. question. I'm just curious if there's any, any, any look at that or if there's any correlation with the higher prices in terms of how well, how, how well the uh, health care entities are being. It doesn't sound like that's right. Yeah. Okay. Can you, because the other thing you see is mic? competition really matters. When even if it's, you only have one hospital, right. people can drive or somebody, other practices can come. Oh, I'm sorry. Other practices can come in, then that can affect the prices a lot too. No, she, that's work. Don't worry about that one. So we have some <laughs> questions here in the front of the room. The ones that are ready. Uh, yeah, my name is Chris Newsmeyer. I live in Edwards. And I've done quite a bit of research on the profitability of the hospitals on the Western Slope. And I've got some information I'm going to share. I wish I had it for everybody. But I will give each of you a copy. Uh, there's one page that is an analysis of the Bell Valley Medical Center from 2001 through 2013. And then there is another page that compares the numbers off the tax returns uh, for several West Slope hospitals. Um, and I'll run through some highlights here in a moment. I wish I had copies for everybody, but... Okay, the Bell Valley Medical Center, going back to 2001... Can you the microphone Okay, sorry about that. Okay, yeah. Bell Valley Medical Center from 2001 through 2014, they have had an increase in revenues, of, an average increase in revenues of 22.8%. Uh, in 2013, uh, consistently, they're making around $41 million a year. Oh, the mic. Okay. 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 Consistently, they're making, the Bell Medical Center is making around $41 million a year, or about 21% net profit on their gross revenues. 
They have got net assets, uh, excluding their real estate, as of the end of 2013, of $257 million, mostly in cash. They are not reinvesting in the community. They are putting out a $100 million renovation on their hospital. They financed that through a $100 million bond. Um, and what they're doing with the rest of this, basically, as near as I can tell, is simply playing the stock market and, and holding cash for who knows what. They've also launched a $75 million fundraising goal as if, for some reason, their current assets are not enough. And so I think there needs to be some looking at how badly is a nonprofit hospital system being abused. Um, and if you look, I did a, also a comparison of uh, Vail Valley, Valeview, Luther, Alamosa, Yampa, Aspen, St. Mary's, St. Anthony's. I could not get the individual tax returns from St. Anthony's, but I did find a report on them. And uh, the net income for Vail Valley is, which we draw by stock in that place, $41 million. Valley View, $21.7 million. Luther, Alamosa, $862,000. Yampa, Seven and a half million, Aspen, six point three million, St. Mary's in Grand Junction, thirty three point eight million, and St. Anthony's, twenty one point six million. Uh, the profit margins, Vale is twenty one percent, Valley View is eleven, uh, Lutheran Alamos is one percent, Camp is nine percent, Aspen's nine percent, St. Mary's is seven percent, St. Anthony's is fourteen percent. So there does seem to be a correlation that along the I-70 corridor that uh, St. Anthony's and Valley View and Bell Valley Medical Center are leading the back here as far as being very money-making nonprofit hostels or what's called tax exempt. They're certainly not nonprofit. Uh, some of these are doing better jobs than others of reinvesting in money in their communities and in their systems, but uh, I really think that there are, there needs to be some scrut public scrutiny given to how these places are being operated. Um, so I hope you guys will include that as part of your considerations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We put up this slide that uh, areas of analysis. These are the topics that the commission is working on and addressing. So any. Um, Thoughts or reactions to these topics that they're um, addressing through their work would be helpful, as well as any um, ideas or innovations that are uh, coming up from the community that are happening here in Summit County or surrounding areas. I'm just going to yell. <laughs> um, I really take issue with the nonprofit and the profit. Those margins are horrific. And we all know it, it's been that way for a long time and it's not being addressed. I have a plate in my arm and 13 screws. The cost for that plate was over $20,000. The cost to make it, the cost, the actual value of it, is probably around $25. I don't know how you justify that and I, know, I don't know why ethics don't enter into this. Yeah. Yes, yes. And why a box of Kleenex is 30 bucks. I mean, these are real simple things. I mean, I know how to balance a checkbook. I know how to keep a budget. And I'm on Medicare now. I'm not as impacted by things. But prior to the affordable health care, I had to pay out of pocket for things. And as this gentleman brought up, to say that it's a nonprofit is a joke. And I would like to see some comparisons with some of the European countries. And I don't really, really see why if one area is making so much money, don't you spread it around? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? If we've got wealth in a certain area or gifts in a certain area, aren't we supposed to spread them around? Not for To profit. equalize it? <laughs> For profit won't do that. That's their whole goal. Well, <laughs> not for profit should. You know, I, I just think that you need to give yourself a different name. And the nonprofit thing, it's kind of like the NFL. They're a nonprofit, a nonprofit organization. 
I've worked with nonprofits, and I know what a nonprofit. Excuse me. I just does. want to set a tone of listening in here, so us that we can actively engage with you. If you would keep the conversation to the microphone, so that everybody has a chance to talk, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, and I don't want to take up too much time, but Continue. I just kind of feel like, in terms of being a sitting down and looking at costs, if something costs thirty dollars. You can charge $40 for it, but you, ch you can't charge $10,000 for it. It's just not right. And that's the way our system is set up now. Taking medication when you're in the hospital, why is it so expensive? I mean, please, I've been asking this question for years. I ask for an itemized statement, and they tell me at the hospital, are you sure you want an itemized statement? Oh yeah, I really do. And it's frightening. It's frightening what the costs are. And I don't understand why there's not any kind of oversight. It doesn't seem like there is. So, I mean, so can I ask you a question? What was the, did, did you approach the hospital about this? Oh that yes. That? Was yeah. it a Western Slope hospital? Yeah, it was St. Anthony. But I think that this applies to yeah. a lot of hospitals. This is not a, this is not just a local. This is not a Frisco uh, issue or a Colorado issue. But Colorado needs to look at it as a state. Well, the way it's supposed to work, um, the way it works. Thank you. The way it works in our system is you determine the cost of whatever it is. In your case, a medical device, it sounds like there's a markup algorithm um, so that you can attempt to cover the cost of whatever the device is plus everything else that goes into implanting that. But um, based on what you said, that, that seems to be a bit usurious, I mean, I, I, and unjustifiable, to be honest with you. I, you know, it, you know what hospital charge should have some semblance to what they pay for the products they buy and all of the labor. Of course, you know, 50% of the cost in the hospitals is just for labor. But um, that, you know, I, I shouldn't comment about a specific hospital that I'm not familiar with, but um, on the surface, that just seems, you know, really high. That's a concern, Michael, extortion. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to say that. Because again, I don't know who that is. So, I, I should comment on individual hospitals. Can you hang on one second? So ma'am, just to your comments, it seems that I just want to be, I want to be clear about what you're, you're saying. I'm hearing that, that you would prefer more transparency so that you can understand what the costs are and how the pricing is structured. And that you're raising issues about Nonprofit hospitals and their community obligations. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, well, there's transparency. When you get the, when you get the bill and you get the printout, and there are all these codes, but then you find out what the codes represent. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who's an epidemiologist, she's very good at this. It's appalling. And I, I just don't see why there isn't some sort of oversight. <clears throat> Well, well, one of the things that we're, this committee is proposing is more transparency pre-scheduled pre procedure so that you can uh, compare hospital prices or physician prices or anesthesiologist prices before, before you actually have whatever you're receiving. That's not realistic at all. That's not even close. Let's make time for the next question. Yeah. I know that there's a lot in the room, so we'll take a question from Alina and then in the front row there. My name is Alicia Kresge. I'm a person who's lived in the county for a long time. Before I went on Medicare, yay, yay, I was paying $1,400 a month for myself in Suffolk County for my um, health insurance. That was with a $6,000 deductible, give or take. My daughter is uh, 21. She's $250 a month. Happens to be in Durango, but the number would have been the same anywhere pretty much in the state for, again, $6,000 deductible. I think the thing that I don't see on this analysis is um, number one, the insurance companies and the huge dollars that they're, pay, they're making. Um, I have taken over my mom's finances of late 
and the process of the medical process of dealing with her claims, etc., which aren't very many. She's a very healthy 93 year old with disease. So she really doesn't have a lot of issues. The time is crazy because the insurance companies have so much back labor to do, theoretically, because my opinion is because they don't want to get it up. Um, anecdotally, time frame ago, 15, 10 years ago, I blew out my ACL, uninsured for, one re for various reasons. I negotiated with the hospital and my price was half because I wasn't going to the insurance industry for the surgery, for the docs, for any of it. I paid them over several years, you know, every month out of my checking account, and they gave me half off on the expense of that surgery and repair. So I think the thing that is not here, which I think that all along has been, is what's the interaction between the insurance companies and why do we need them in this world? That's your question. <laughs> <laughs> That's your question. Your question. Any, any comments from the commissioner? No, please continue. Okay, you know you're going to say something when you're talking about 93-year-old from the Three-year-old, and I'm from Lake County, Leadville. I see lots of my neighbors here, and I'm glad to say that we almost lost our hospital last year. And unless you're talking to rural providers, you're not going to get a good answer here. And I know you're from Denver. I wish there was more rural providers on your commission, and I hope you go talk to them. And I, I visited Leadville for 20 years. I've used the St. Vincent's ER. I don't believe, and I don't know, maybe Alice or our commissioner that's here knows, I don't believe St. Vincent's has made a profit for years, have they? I mean, now listen, folks. <laughs> There's got to be a way to spread this around. I don't think health care should be for profit mm -hmm. at all. Because my life is worth a hell of a lot more than your salary, sir. Sorry about that. And I've worked in private. I'm a psychiatric social worker. I've worked in private hospitals. But, and I don't know, I mean, there used to be, back in the day, legal services would tell anyone that didn't have insurance, there's federal money. I imagine you get federal money in, in Denver, don't you, at your hospital? And you are required to serve folks that don't have insurance. Is my understanding. That's my understanding. I don't think we're back where Billy Holiday having to bleed to death in a car. <coughs> I'm mad. I'm really mad. I think there's a special place in hell for insurance people. I had a psychiatrist, and I'm sorry, I had a psychiatrist that had to blackmail by taking them on the phone to get two more days for a suicide board. Parity for mental health is not happening, folks. We don't, I, I'm very active, and I see another member on my board with uh, NAMI High Country, Colorado, that serves so much more caring. Our folks are serving time in jail. That should be criminal on y'all's part, on our legislators' part. I'm sorry, really. She's heard this from me quite a bit. It should be criminal. A jail is not where you get mental health care. One of my friends who was uh, arrested in a manic state in Salida got worse in jail because they had lights on. Nobody gave him anything to cover his eyes. Rural jails do not have mental health care. I've worked in, in urban jails that do, and they're not great. I mean, jail is not meant to be a mental health center. And I would just about bet you money, I know in my hometown, Nashville, Tennessee, I live here now, but I lived there 40 years, our largest mental health facility in Nashville, which is a state capital and has a stateside hospital, is the Davidson County Jail. This is criminal in my opinion. And so I'd like to see you put some parity up on this when you're looking at transparency. We were supposed to have parity, I thought, with the Affordable Care Act. And there's gaps in that Affordable Care Act. There are people who cannot afford it. It's cheaper to take the tax, uh, uh, whatever, you know, that it has to pay. No, I'm talking about the tax you have to pay, the penalty, um, than it is to buy this, the insurance. 
And so I may be in hell too someday, so I hope to see a lot of insurance people down I'm the Executive Director of the Family and Intercultural Resource Center in Summit County. Um, our mission is really to help our working class families be successful, sustainable, and thrive in this community. Um, we also are a health coverage site. We enroll at CHP Plus, Medicaid, and The Exchange. Um, last year, we enrolled about 1,000 folks in Summit County in insurance. Good news. A lot of them are new, so that's exciting. Bad news. Um, there, for every person we enrolled, there were probably five that couldn't afford the options that were available to them. Um, so on behalf of the clients that we work with, what I'd like to say today is that we're tired of the thing that we need. I don't care if it's the hospital fault, the insurance company's fault, I don't care whose fault it is. But we need to see these solutions, and not just one solution, we need to see a number of solutions. We need to throw everything up at the wall and see what sticks. Um, I prepared, and Elizabeth is going to be very familiar with this, just a little chart um, that shows the average income and, and the self-sufficiency standard of uh, the clients that we work with and then the median income for Summit County. We can pass it down for you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Not enough hands, clearly. Um, so what this shows is that for the average clients that we work with, which you have enough, um, for the clients that we work with, they are at 63% on average of what it actually costs to live in Summit County right now. So they're not even close to being financially self-sufficient. For our median income families, median income in Summit County is about $82,000 for a family of four, they are just at 100%. That means for everybody below median income, thousands of families in Summit County, they can no longer afford to live here. And I would direct these comments sort of to the social determinants of health. It's not obviously just about health insurance. I mean, market rent for a two-bedroom apartment in Silverthorne or Dillon is $1,500, right? So that's going to take 50% of most of our clients' salaries. That doesn't leave money for health insurance. It doesn't leave money for child care. And so for these folks, I would urge you to look at a variety of different solutions. Let's look at the structure, structure of the tax credits. You know, most of our families, their kids qualify for CHP+, Plus, but when their kids get CHP+, Plus, the parents end up spending more for health insurance because their tax credits are reduced. Let's look at that structure. Let's look at the gaps between Medicaid and the exchange. There are still income gaps between those two systems. And if we could manage to fix those, then perhaps more working class families in Summit County or more individuals in Summit County would qualify for Medicaid, which might bring our overall health insurance costs down. I would urge you to look at one geographic rating area and see what the study shows, because I think that is certainly a solution for all of us. But what I have to ask everyone to stop doing is finger pointing. From the folks on the front range, we hear that our costs are higher. We know that our costs are higher in Summit County. Kaiser introduced itself to the market, and we haven't seen for next year any real reduction in the rates. So competition alone is not going to be the answer. From our folks on the friends on the provider side and our friends on the hospital, what we hear is that they have to provide, they have to charge more because they're providing high cost of care for our tourists who demand the plates and the screws and everything else. And they have to even that out over one year. So when I ask the president of our hospital to give me an example, he points to our flight, flight helicopter. Obviously, we want to have the helicopter year round. But he has to pay the salary for that pilot when he's really only using the pilot six months out of the year. And that makes the cost go up. I can't argue with the data that says that their profit margin is higher. I don't want to argue with that data. I don't want to point fingers. I would ask everyone to just stop pointing fingers and let's find some solutions. Let's just start trying things, whatever it is. Because these families, they can't afford to live here anymore. And if they can't afford to live here, then there's nobody to turn on the lifts in the morning. There's nobody to open the retail shop on Main Street. And there's certainly no one to send to our schools. And there's no one for the police chiefs to help. There's nobody in this community that keeps a ghost town. And that is what is going to happen if we don't find some solutions soon. So I thank you all very much for your time on this issue. I know it's not easy. I know you get yelled at a lot, 
Um, but please, let's just find some solutions to start finding. Thank you for your comments. You, you said um, uh, change or do something about the structure of tax credits. Can you talk about what, what kinds of things you have in mind? I mean, I think if costs in Summit County are higher because they're really subsidizing care for the state, even though I know that's not the data that goes into the ABCD database, but that is essentially what happens. So then there must be some way to look at the tax credit structure and increase it because of the metric that that dynamic creates. I don't, you know, I'm not an economist, I'm not brilliant, but I would say that if we look at that tax credit structure and take these regions in Colorado, or these counties in Colorado that sort of cost shift or take the burden from some of the other institutions, medical institutions in the state, then there ought to be a way to create a similar metric for the tax credit. <laughs> What, what tax credit? I'm confused about what tax credit. Oh, I'm assuming you're talking about all pay uh, Yes, the tax credit. The subsidies. The subsidies, the subsidies. Okay. subsidies on the exchange. Because, exactly. yeah. Elizabeth, the tax credit, say you make $45,000 in Denver, mm -hmm. it correlates the same if you make $45,000 in Aspen. But your cost of living in Aspen is twice as much as it is. So that's a big gap. It's a huge gap. And the gap between Medicaid and tax credit eligibility, can you elaborate a little bit about yeah, what you're so talking about? Yeah, so this doesn't. You know, this mostly affects individuals, obviously. Um, but there are still gaps between how Medicaid calculates income um, and how the exchange calculates income, right? And so there are still a lot of individuals and families where you have one member who's going to be affected by that and can't get coverage as a result. And that is just wrong. And that's a simple fix. You just need to use this same. You can kind of out of Medicaid. You know. Right. Well, and then obviously this community struggles with churn, which does yeah, not help right. our costs, right? So somebody has health insurance through Vail Resorts for three months, and then they don't have any health insurance, and then they go to the care clinic, and that drives up all of our costs as well. Okay, one more. Do we, do very many people participate in the exchange through the small business uh, portal? Um, so we're actually not a small business hub, so I can't give you the exact numbers. Um, I think, I will just say as a small business, you know, somebody who runs a small business, we have 50 employees. Um, about a third of those get their health insurance coverage through the FERC. Um, we don't qualify because our incomes are too high for any tax credits or subsidies. Um, this year alone, we will spend $250,000 on insurance for those you know, 20 employees, roughly. Um, that money could be used to help 200 kids start kindergarten ready to learn. It could be used to help 150 families in Summit County remain stable. Um, and there is no relief for my organization. We have tried, we have just, you know, talked about partnerships with the care clinic in terms of just providing basic coverage and then only buying catastrophic plans for our employees. We have gone, you know, we have looked, John and I have looked at having a self-insured plan and whether or not that would give us any cost relief. And there is nothing for us and it is bankrupting my organization. Okay. So Thanks. what kind of, you mentioned earlier about Can you use the mic significant uh, rate increases this year or, or going into 17. Can, can you give us a ballpark of a, relative to what those So we look obviously like? haven't seen the rates because um, uh, they're not approved yet. Um, but what we have seen preliminary rates increases statewide. Kaiser, which is what 97% of the folks that we enrolled <coughs> through the exchange last year chose, is projecting yeah. a 20% increase statewide. That is over a 20% increase from last year to this year. So that's a 40% increase for those folks who either chose Colorado Health Op, which is now no longer with us, right. or Kaiser. Um, so that's really the number that I'm referring to. But if you look at, I mean, that's really the only option for families up here at this point. It's not affordable for Edna, Rocky Mountain. Health plans is no longer an option for most families. It's Kaiser. Actually, Rocky Mountain will no longer offer in Summit, they'll only do Mesa. Um, Connect with Health Power, I've just released uh, projections to the Division of Insurance. Uh, Sir, would you use the mic too? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Anthem, uh, just uh, their number, I think, for individual will be 26 point something percent. They got rid of the PPO, so everyone will have to do the HMO. Uh, so that means less choice. Uh, Humana is, yeah, they're not doing anything on the exchange. Neither is United Healthcare. They're doing group. Uh, there is a new company called Bright Insurance that uh, they are teamed up with Centura. So they will be starting in uh, 2017, but we don't know what the rates for the product look like yet. Uh, we're just struggling. Yeah. 
If I could just say, ditto times two if you live in Lake County. Our, our annual incomes are like 60000 Same cost, however, because we're in the same geographic region, and Kaiser doesn't operate up there either. So we're going to be left with one, uh, one provider. And my rates this year went up 27%, and it goes up every year as a non as a small employer. 27% increase in our insurance. Alice, did you introduce yourself? I'm Alice Pugh. I'm the executive director of Full Circle. I've been like since I've got conch, can I talk for a bit? Uh, my name is John Crow. I am a father, uh, a husband, and uh, actually I'm an insurance broker as well, so please, I'm not going to help, please. <laughs> um, but two of the things up here that uh, really hit close to home are the transparency and the administrative costs. That keeps coming up everywhere. And I echo what the mayor says. It's done with finger pointing. Um, I'm done with people coming to my office upset, tears, crying, you know, frustration. Um, like Tamara said, our community community is a critical mass. It is it is really really going to suffer here in the next year or two. We don't have three years to wait for a decision. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed in the 15 years that I've been up here doing insurance, um, I look at plans like uh, how we call it out where they had eight simple plans. People understood them. I also look at uh, the Medicare supplements. You know, people understand them. You know, and you can still have the free market where Anthem and whoever else offers the same plans. But this is the big issue that, you know, our community faces. They don't understand anything. Quite honestly, as a broker, it takes me, it's a full-time job just to understand what the networks will cover. Because if I say Anthem, People go and think, oh, I've got Anthem. Um, but do you know what? Anthem has three different plans, just in Colorado. They have a Rocky Mountain Health Plan that a lot of people signed up for in some county. What those people don't know is if something major happens to them, they're probably not covered because the two hospitals that will cover them are Vail Valley and St. Anthony's. So if you take your child down to a children's hospital, they're going to be told that they have no insurance. So this is where I think, you know, we need to have that transparency and the administrative costs, I think, if we can make things simple, maybe take a backwards approach and, and look at the Medicare supplement, maybe look at what Cover Colorado used to do, um, and then, you know, let them offer whatever plans they want on the side. But if we can make it simple, so maybe there are seven, eight plans, and that's it. Are you talking about on the exchange or off the exchange or both? Any way you want to do it. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Can you get the mic? Sorry. <laughs> I'm curious if it's intensified in the last few years since the passage of the Obamacare regulations on the insurance yes. market. As okay, as here. Completely. Oh, I, my question was whether it's the, the problems have intensified in the last few years with the Obamacare takeover of the individual market or whether it's been. It's, well, for example, I would say about five, six years ago before Obamacare, yeah. I could go get a plan for my family for about $450. That was $350 or $35 co-pays. I had prescription drug coverage, $1,500 deductible, $4,500 out of pocket, and like I said, about $450 a month. To get that plan right now, um, quite honestly, I'd have to go to an PPO, uh, be about a four thousand dollar deductible, um, and for my family, it'd be about fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars. I'm also an insurance agent. Um, with, I know John and Mike over here in the White Hats, also an insurance agent that spoke at the first question. But um, it's, I figure if I ever get arrested for something, I'm going to go to Judge Casillas and say that I've already done my community service because. The time that we spend to help these people to get through the Medicaid, get or through the med, or get them into Medicaid, and then some people don't want to go into Medicaid, and once they're in Medicaid, they're stuck. There's no way out. Um, we can't go back into the Colorado Peak thing and say, oh, well, let's change this if they've already been approved for Medicaid, they're stuck. Do you want Medicare? No, Medicaid. Medicaid. Yeah, anybody that applies. So what this is what happens when we go into the Colorado Exchange. So a customer comes in, and Tamara can. You, Said, okay, so a customer comes in, this is what really happens. They come in, you get their, their name and everything, and you get how much they're paying, and then you go in to connect for help. 
which is pure hell. And I say that because Connect for Health does not use Internet Explorer. Connect for Health should put on their website, please use Google Chrome. Because that has caused so many nightmares for people in the public. And all they have to do is put that little word on their website. They got, what, a couple hundred million dollars to set up um, Connect for Health? For the federal government, they got hundreds of millions of dollars. But they can't do little changes like that. So Connect for Health, um, Okay, so you come in, you go in, and you see if somebody wants to qualify for a subsidy, and pop in if you guys want to. So you, so you go into the get a subsidy. You have to go into Colorado Peak. So I try to help my customers, just like Tamara does and John does, to go through Colorado Peak and help these people get through. And sometimes this is an hour, two hour um, meeting to do this. Um, if that's got to be simplified um, to go through all that, and then the computers lock up. And then if you call Connect for Help, you're online for an hour as an agent, and we've got, what, $20 per person, maybe, for a commission? That's why I said I'm doing my community service already. So um, you, you get hung up on, or then you get disconnected after you've been on hold. So stuff like that needs to be fixed for Connect for Health. I think Connect for Health is a lot of our problem. When we signed our agent agreements last year, we were told we could not talk disparagingly about Connect for Health. But they took that out of the contract after some agents complained about it. <laughs> yes, I mean it's really it's it's I think they're a root of a lot of the problems, and I think it's, that has to be looked at to make that technology so much easier and faster. Can I ask you? Do you think that's actually driving healthcare costs? I mean, what do you guys think? I think it's a barrier to enrollment. Yeah, it's a barrier yeah. to enrollment. Yeah. One way to Correct. drive costs out is to make sure people yeah. are enrolled. But yeah. yes. Okay. And I guess I guess aggravated with that. Hundred, not not a million dollars, not two million dollars. They got hundreds and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And just one thing on the side, a lot of their stuff is now outsourced to Alabama. It's not even jobs in Colorado anymore. That kind of really angers me. Well, Connect for Health Colorado released a week or two ago. Uh, it was a stack uh, that said that they increased uh, Medicaid personnel by thirty-one thousand just for Colorado. So. I'm not sure how that works. Um, you know, whether it's in doctor offices, whether it's in. Oh, oh I see. You know what I mean? You mean people? Oh, people the, the rates. The, that was, no, that Medicaid was the rates. The rates. The model yeah. for the Colorado Health Foundation that was projecting what the Medicaid expansion had done for employment. Is that right? That yeah. 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 I have yeah. some experience with Medicaid. Uh, I, I'm Dr. Chris Ebert Santos. I've had a clinic here for 17 years. We take care of children, and recently, in the last two years, have added an adult uh, care to our clinic, Ebert Family Clinic. Uh, for 20 years, I worked in Saipan and the Northern Marianas Islands, and I never had to worry about insurance or coding or whether somebody could pay or not. Everyone got taken care of, and uh, I just agree, first of all, that the health health of care payment system that we have is such a, a disaster, it's a barrier, it's a nightmare. I had a grown man crying in my office last week because my front desk had to tell him that his insurance had been canceled. They didn't tell us why, they didn't call him and tell him why, and he had two children and an $800 bill. It, it, on the other hand, uh, when you talk about incentive mechanisms and payment and delivery reform, uh, my office is 55% Medicaid, and I've survived all these years, but I've survived even better since the ACA because they did have a little bump in our reimbursement for a year and a half or two years when they implemented the ACA. Then Stephen Poole, who was a pediatrician at Children's Hospital, worked very hard for many years, established his Children's um, Access health access program. And what he did is that he worked with the legislature to give each of us who are seeing Medicaid patients a little bit more, maybe it was 5% or 10%, halfway, halfway between what we were getting on Medicaid, 40 cents on the dollar, and what we might get on Medicare, which is a physician's reimbursement of 50 or 60% on the dollar. That made such a big difference. We were able to expand our clinic. But in return for that, we had to give um, more continuity of care. Now, I've always given continuity of care because all my family's patients are given my cell phone number and they can call me anytime, day or night. And I am not very busy. I can keep them 
in my ER, you know how much money that saves. If I switch up a laceration in my office at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night instead of them going to the ER, and also I, they can build up their trust in me. I know them. I, can, I hardly ever do tests, uh, x-rays, lab tests, because we have this relationship. Because they can call me back if the situation changes. We can put them in the hospital. We can send oxygen home. Just this a model of having your doctor who knows you and you know them. And this is another problem with the insurance. Because the, every time you switch insurances, they're wanting you to sh change doctors. And that's, that's really a problem for us as doctors and even as providers. I think I'm going to be on Medicare in three months. And what a blow up my back. I don't want, I always say this again and again. Um, patients come into my office, middle class families who are on Medicaid. For example, this family, the dad's a painter, he can support his family, but he's forced to go on Medicaid because his son has a chronic condition and has to see a lot of specialists and take very expensive me medicine. Um, so I, I wish everyone could be on Medicaid even though I get paid a lot less. And I wish everyone could be on Medicare uh, because you know what you're going to get. As a physician, you know what you're going to get paid. As a patient, you know what services you can get. There may be some limitations on what physicians you see, uh, but I think if we have pass Amendment 69 and we have 95% of our doctors in Colorado <coughs> accepting Colorado care, that even that will be less of a I think there's a question right here with the microphone. I know there's two against the wall, and then I'll come back over to the side of the room. So this is Alice again, and I just want to offer two potential solutions, if I could. Um, one is, if we were allowed as small employers to join associations, and as an association have better buying power, that would be huge for us. And that is not permitted right now, and I hope that you're looking at that. The other one is, as a small employer, if I could have my employees buy their own insurance and I could reimburse them, that would also be a huge help. And the, those, those things are illegal right now. And if there's any way to fix our current system, those are two potential avenues that I would hope that the commission would look at. There's a bill in Congress to let employers contribute to insurance. It's just been introduced. So there's hope. Great. Right. Although the challenge is you lose the tax benefit. That's the challenge. The channel. Wrong one. Wrong one. Loud voice. This is actually not working. Uh, there you go. The, the, the challenge. Part of the challenge, and Congress would have to deal with this, um, is that um, people get, of course, a tax benefit from having their employer or purchasing health insurance through their employer. They get. A significant discount, so to speak, because of that tax benefit. So you'd have to figure out a way to have that tax benefit go with the individual, go with the individual, so that, so that they don't have to pay actually more out of pocket for health insurance. But that's a congressional issue. Um, so my name is Martha Bird, and I work over at Summit County Animal Ambulance, and I do medical billing over there. I would highly encourage you to look into all of the insurance, especially and the Blue Cross. People do not understand their policies. They don't know when they're being underpaid for their um, procedures or whatever. We do this constantly. We now have pre-printed stickers that say, please call your insurance. Tell them they need to pay according to your emergency services policy. Because people are being left holding 75, 80% of the bill because they don't know that they need to call their insurance and have them do it right. Edna, Cigna, and them. They all do it. And then Cigna generally fix it as soon as the patient calls. And them, it's a nightmare. These people are left with thousands of dollars for one annual year. And it's, it's written in their policy that it's an emergency service. It's written in the Affordable Health Care Act. It should be covered. And they're just not paying for it. And they, I think they honestly think if people don't call and complain, they may make an extra thousand, two thousand dollars off that patient. Hmm. Hi, I'm Commissioner Mike Cordoni from Lake County, and you heard from some of the folks here. Also, I wanted to say thank you all for coming here and listening to us. 
as you can tell, we're, we're pretty, um, we're more than pretty concerned. But um, also thank you to Billy Hamner who raised so many folks awareness about this meeting today. You know, at Lake, in Lake County right now, according to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we're ranked 57th out of 64 counties. We're at 25% uninsured. This is from 9% uninsured three years ago. So our folks are dropping out, paying the penalty um, in droves, and I'm really worried that that is going to happen even more so once this next rate increase happens. We don't have the guys of plan to choose from. Um, the two groups, obviously, on the individual market contractors, um, of which we have a ton of them, nonprofits, small businesses, which make up the majority of our workforce in Lake County, um, are those folks that are mostly opting to go without. Then the folks are teachers and government, which are second two biggest employers, are choosing to hide deductible plans. Our median income is actually $46,700. So it's, it's really bad at $82,000, and it's catastrophic at $46,700. Um, I make right around that amount, and my family's deductible is $12,000 out of pocket. That's why my daughter waited two days to go get an x-ray on her foot last week. Um, and I just wanted to say, you've heard some ideas. Um, the transparency, which hopefully helps Bill 1336, also gives us some better clarity for, um, is great, but then how you work with those providers. Um, in, in a heard Sarah Bain talk about the carve-out for the, the nexus of the lowest income and highest premium counties. Um, you know, when we went from 11 geographic districts to nine, um, our rates actually in Lake County went up. They didn't come down. Um, so we, if, if we can't get really, we don't have a Summit Community Care clinic, clinic or anything equivalent to that. We have a public health agency. This year in uh, 2016, as a county government, we transferred an additional 44% out of our general fund to uh, increase to subsidize our public health agency because the grants and reimbursements, and that's another area where I think you could help assist, it, that are going to provide those basic services, immunizations, and other um, visits uh, have decreased because as affordable care came in, uh, a lot of those things were supposed to be going to the, to the private providers, and now that those folks are coming back due to the cost, um, we're seeing them back. Um, likewise, you know, 3.5 million of our, of our $20 million budget is to human services with 1.75 million going to um, rent and food assistance for our folks. That number is climbing, and um, you know, I, we all sometimes hear that, well, folks chose to live out in the mountains, we're choosing to live here. You know, um, but there is also the, the fact that we have had folks that didn't, you know, they, they didn't intentionally just choose that. These aren't our invincible 20-somethings. These are our working families. These are the folks who are actually working in, in the governments, in the schools, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the jobs which were middle income just a few years ago. So um, I'm, I'm not optimistic that Amendment 69 is going to pass because I know altruism generally ends at a pocketbook. But um, if there is the ability to look at those most impacted communities and or increase those grants back to those agencies uh, that are serving those folks who are without, uh, it would help us dramatically. Thank you. Commissioner, just um, I know you hinted at it, but just to clarify a little yeah. bit more. So what do you, what's Turn really accounting for that? big difference in Lake County. What makes Lake County different than even Summit County? Is it the income disparity? Um, you know, what drove that 25% uninsured the, the, the drastic increase. I mean, we were featured on Colorado Public Radio for our success in signing folks up on the health exchange. But as, as every increase has come up, and we've been seeing compounding 20% increases year after year, folks are saying, you know what, I, here's an example. I just applied for a job at a nonprofit. They're offering a $200 a month subsidy for your health insurance. I'm thinking that's enough to pay my penalty, <laughs> but that's not enough to actually get health insurance for my family. And I mean, I'm, I'm a master's degree middle income earning person, so if that's happening to me, holy cow. I also think to, to some of the points that were made, there's a lot of folks that have a lot of misinformation about it, and, but I also know that um, it's, it's purely, uh, our rent, for example, you know, you have a, um, in Summit County and Eagle County, they've seen a huge resurgence of folks coming back, moving back, buying those single family homes. Average single family home uh, cost in Summit County is over $800,000. 
Ours in Lake County is $188,000, so we are such a bargain that all of our available housing stocks and, and rental stock just disappeared. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our, our subsidized apartment building that our complex that we had was just bought for uh, $13.5 million by a Chinese investor. Because, and what's happening is folks are watching their rents skyrocket. We've seen over a 30% increase in home costs, more than that in rent costs. And it's primarily folks from Summit Eagle that are being priced out of here, coming to the last cheap place, which is Lake County. And so our folks are saying, do I pay rent or do I have health care or do I eat? And they're choosing rent and eat. Thank you. Question right here in the front. I don't need a microphone. Because I'm taking this very personal, which I'm told I shouldn't. Anyway, my name is Anonymous, and I represent my wife, Mrs. Anonymous. We've been living up here for 24 years. We're being forced out of the county now. Uh, first, I want to talk about transparency. I had a minor hand operation outpatient in St. Anthony's. Got a bill from my anesthesiologist. I understood that. Got a bill from my surgeon, okay. I get a bill from the hospital, and it's just, I get a bill. So I call up and I say, look, I would like this itemized. So they give me a phone number down in Denver, and I speak to some woman in charge of billing down there. So I'd like to get an itemized bill. I'd like to know what I'm paying for. Sorry, we can't do that. You got whatever you had done with your hand, all the prices or whatever's involved, is that's the price we're charging. Could, for a year, I tried to get an itemized bill from these people, couldn't get it. I just gave up. Just not worth it. Um, what else? My wife and I were on COBRA right now. That ends in about four months. I'm on a PPO because I have severe heart condition, and I prefer to go out of state where I know where there's good heart hospitals to get work done, okay? Well, she's now working for a small group, five people, employees. They're going to offer, we're paying 950 right now per month. So our insurance bill is going to go up to $1,400 if she goes to the small group and it's HMO. I can't get out of state, all right? If I went to the exchange for the same insurance we have right now, it'll be $1,800. And then it's supposed to go up another 30% for 2017. That's $2,400 a month, okay? So we're being forced out of here. We're going to have to go down where it's more competitive. Um, this is just unbelievable. Um, I, I, I just don't know what to say. You're forcing everyone out of the county, unless they make $100,000 a year, you can't afford to live up here and take care of everybody up here. Like they said, you know, work the lifts, work in restaurants, whatever. Um, I don't know if you all really get it. It seems like study after study is the same with what to do with I-70, study after study after study. <laughs> you know, that's all it is. And we won't have an idea until 2017. How did this happen? How did this come about like this? I, I just don't understand it. I'm not supposed to take it personal? Sorry, I take it very personal. I don't represent a group here. We're, you know, I love you guys. <laughs> I do, I do. A little, little story. Since the system is so screwed up, I was seeing a cardiologist. I used to come up here from Denver. And anyway, this guy, my cardiologist, a very good cardiologist, he decided he got, he was spending a third of his day just working through insurance papers and everything. So he went out, now he's a concierge doctor, okay? I pay a certain amount a year to see him. So he asked me a couple years ago, I was about 60 at the time, and he goes, what's your goal in life? I said, to make it to Medicare, and he laughed at me. This is when he was still in his group. So he's working for himself now, and I just saw him a couple of months ago. And I asked him, I said, what's your goal in life? He said, to make it to Medicare. <laughs> okay, this is a cardiologist, and now he's having to deal with it, all right? Uh, 
this state, I should say this country is so screwed up that we can't get it together to get a nationalized Medicare for everybody to work all this out. Another thing, doctors, most of them are fee-based doctors, okay? In other words, they want to get as much work as they can, and I ended up having unnecessary surgery in my hand. Now, if you do some work, you'll find out there are some hospitals. Cleveland Clinic, probably the best hospital system we have in this country, they work on salary. All their surgeons work on salary, so they are not incentivized excuse my language here, to work as much as they can, you know, you get in, you get out, the next guy come in, you get in, so we can build more and more. One last thing, if you want to know what happened to the healthcare in this country, there's a book called America's Bitter Pill by Stephen Brill, okay? Go to the library, read this thing, find out what happened in this country, what happened with Obamacare, what went on beforehand. Get educated. Get pissed off. <laughs> Get really pissed off, man. And I wish you guys would speak up. I have a hearing impediment. And even with a microphone, you get whispering in the middle. <laughs> Come on, we want to hear what y'all have to say. All right, well, now we're not competing with the, with the seniors, but thank you all. The, the reason the commission came on the road is to hear these personal stories um, and what's happening in the community. So I think this is, as all the other meetings have been super valuable for the commission to understand the dynamics across the state. So Sarah, Emily, Thank you. So, there's somebody here too. I'm Sarah Bain. I'm the CEO of the Summit Community Care Clinic here in Frisco. All of our doctors and mid levels are on salary, but they're terrible salaries. So there, there is no fee-for-service type uh, payment there. So I'm always really pleased when our neighbors from Park and Lake come over to give their perspective because um, everybody's struggling, I think, but even if you have insurance in Perkin Lake, there's no providers to go see. So when you talk about the increase, the 25% increase in uninsured, my guess is they, they're saying, why, why on earth would I pay for insurance when, you know, I have to travel an hour or, or longer to get to a medical provider? So I do want people to know that uh, Care Clinic sees, loves Medicaid and loves uninsured. 67% of our patients are still uninsured. And we love our uninsured as our neighbors and our friends and as uh, the people that we are meant to serve, but we also are struggling mightily to continue providing services because of the, uh, the lack of reimbursement. But we're gonna survive. So, uh, so I also wanted to say that um, I think there's a lot of mixed feelings about the Affordable Care Act and there's certainly things that have, we have seen things go very awry. I will say that I have seen uh, the Medicaid expansion be life-saving for many, many people in this community, and many of them are trying to get to Medicare. So they're um, older adults, their kids have gone on or they never had kids. Maybe they're struggling with chronic illness and they can't work full time, and those are many of our Medicaid patients. So the fact that we, we do have Medicaid expansion, I think is one thing that went really, really right. And in terms of, um, Financially, at least we're getting, if people don't like the Medicaid reimbursement rate, those of us who see uh, uninsured folks, at least we're getting reimbursement. And FQHCs get better reimbursement because we see the uninsured. But, um, you know, if, if those people went to a hospital and they're uninsured and now they have Medicaid, it is, it is a benefit to all the providers who um, are willing or required to see uninsured folks. Um, and then I guess I would just say that, um, you know, some community care clinic has been here for 23 years. We provide medical, dental, and mental health to people in our community. And we, um, you know, we're a locally grown, not, well, we are a corporation, but we truly are a nonprofit. If you want to look at our nine, <laughs> you'll be able to see there is no margin. And uh, you can also see our most highly paid employees, which are, you know, I, I can't even look at those numbers. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to share that. I think. Most FQHCs in the state have the problem of what do we do with all this extra Medicaid money now? And we still are, are struggling with 67% uninsured. That number's increased by 12% over the last year. So we ended uh, the, our fiscal year in 2015 at 58% uninsured, and now we're back up to 67% uninsured. So. Wait, can you? 
Can you talk about <laughs> Can you talk about specialty access? What do you want to know? There is none. Okay. <laughs> That's I would say for Medicaid in particular, dental is a huge issue, so we take down, but we've got patients that come from as far as Buena Vista and Salida. We have a three month waiting list now. Um, we're actually building, expanding our dental clinic on the third floor of the medical office building. And we did just put uh, two days a week, I think we are, in Leadville, in a little office seeing uninsured and Medicaid only. Um, and we also have a, a school-based health center in Leadville now that um, families can use, not just children, but families. That's not helpful this summer. So we have some specialists that um, volunteer in our clinic, and they'll see patients and make assessments, and they'll say, well, they need surgery. And then I say, okay, <laughs> well, they can't afford surgery. So um, we, are doing, we do a lot of navigation trying to get university or Caritas or other places to um, do surgery on our most uh, critical patients. But even with Medicaid, um, there's providers who used to take Medicaid up here who don't anymore. Um, or there's waiting lists for, yes, we take Medicaid, um, but you have to wait six months to get in uh, to see somebody. So the specialty piece is missing. Missing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Emily, Don, Betty. Pete Short, <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> I'm Emily Tracy. I'm a candidate for the state senate. Live here in Summit County, and thank you for being here and listening to these stories. It, it really is beyond eye-opening to hear uh, not only the individual stories that just Mary told about cost, and I have my own story about cost being uh, in observation at the facility here several years ago for less than 24 hours and getting a $19,000 bill for observation. So we have many, I mean, if you want to raise your hands, how many personal stories are there? Probably more than we heard today. But in addition to that, I think what we're really hearing is there are such huge problems with all parts of this system, or most parts, that we can't just keep tinkering with little pieces of it and make it better. We have huge cost issues that have been brought up over and over. What is a profit margin for a nonprofit? What is that supposed to be? We have delivery issues where we don't truly have competition in rural Colorado that might solve delivery issues or might not. We just don't have that. We have middleman issues, the insurance companies that are still a source of a lot of the pain and hard work, whether you're the individual getting health care or you're the insurance agent trying to help someone get health care or you're the provider trying to get paid. Huge issues with that. And then we have to and I think we have to look at this system as our health care poor bears. That's the way I'm starting to look at it. And we don't still drive poor bears. I mean, some of us are old enough to know what a poor bear is. I excuse you know, those of you who don't know, but many of us do know. You can fix a lot of parts on a poor bear, but you still have such huge problems, it's not going to work right. There's a reason why we're hearing such support throughout for some kind of single-payer system. People like their Medicare. People like Medicaid for similar kinds of reasons. And so we, we have to not look at all these other things all the time and try to tinker with these major issues that just don't work. Now, the Affordable Care Act did open a door. It unlocked the poor bear door for some folks. And that's wonderful. But at the same time, it's still a poor bear. And we have to remember the Affordable Care Act was written by the insurance industry years ago. Whether we like it or not, whether it's helping some people marginally or not, it's not the ultimate solution. So I just, I don't think we can say strongly enough that we have to look at the really big issues before we talk about, gee, how do we get more specialists? Or how do we do more with uh, telemedicine? Or can we tinker with the tax credit so it's not so ridiculous sounding? So I, I just wanted to make those comments and thank you for your time. Thank you. I'm uh, Don Parsons, um, and I have uh, some governance responsibility for the hospital as well as the uh, care clinic. And I'd like to build on Sarah's comments. Elizabeth, you were a member of the uh, leader, the chair, and the co-chair of the 208 Commission. Committee chair. Yeah, so you go back a long way. 
And Marcy, certainly, Marcy and I were on the board about 25 years ago together. And Jeff and I worked together in various capacities. We've been struggling for a long time. We're not making much progress. The 2A Commission heard from their economic uh, analysts. Uh, how many years ago was that? that uh, the only option of the four that were looked at was a single payer option, which perhaps was politically unfeasible. Care Clinic in Summit County has 7,200 unduplicated patients. 7,055. 7,065. I'm sorry, it's off by 3%. <laughs> um, this is an accounting of 30, 000, less than 30,000 people. Now, some of those people, as Sarah explained, come from Lake County or come from Park County or other places. But that's a big chunk of the primary care, dental care, behavioral health care provided in some counties. 67% of those are uninsured. Our cost to provide a visit, primary care visit is $309. Our average payment those are self-pay patients. It's sixty dollars. So do the math. We're almost two hundred and fifty dollars in the hole. Every patient. Two hundred and fifty thousand. Two hundred and fifty dollars per patient. Oh, per patient. Sorry. For every patient we see. The money is made up by aggressive grant writing, solicitation of donations, and so forth. In some county, we have three problems. The first is affordable housing. Everybody knows that. The second is funding our school system. Everybody knows that. We will have ballot initiatives in November for both of those, raising taxes for both of those elements. The third major problem is health care, which you're hearing about today. There is no public financing in the county, except for some free rent to support the community care clinic. So the care clinic is dang, as Sarah described out, with 20% or higher premiums in the offer coming up in the next enrollment period. What do you think is going to happen to people who have to make a decision about whether they're going to get insurance? They will choose to pay the penalty. And so a larger number of people who are uninsured or underinsured, those people who have high deductibles and can't afford them, so they come to the care clinic. And they get written off as well. Our problem in providing this very important essential health care to Southern County is going to get worse. And maybe even to the point of requiring drastic action to curtail those much needed services. So you need to hear this year the Affordable Health Care <laughs> Cost Commission. Just one little story from Paul Berg in uh, rural Colorado. But take it home with you. Thank you for being here. My name is uh, Betty Sarber, and I am a mom, a proud mom, of a child with a mental illness. And so I just want to talk about some of the disparities between physical health and mental health care in the rural communities that I've seen over the years that I've been trying to navigate care for my son. And um, we have incredible providers up here in our community behavioral health centers and our community care clinic that provide services to mental health patients who need services and take insurance. <laughs> they actually take insurance. But when you try to access any kind of mental health care in our community outside of those two entities, nobody takes insurance. So even with the Affordable Care Act and you're paying this huge premium, if your issue happens to be in the mental health realm, you can't use your insurance if you try to access care unless you go to the care clinic or the community behavior health center. And as good as those places are, we all know that there's a huge stigma around people accessing care for mental health services. 
So some prefer to go to a quiet little office building with a private little therapist, hoping they don't see their neighbors and their friends there, because they're still embarrassed to admit that they have, they have a reason to seek care, which is sad in itself. But it is the reality of trying to get people accessible, affordable health care. So it's really more of an observation. I don't know where it fits in the analysis, but um, that's my thoughts. Thank you. Um, I too have a daughter with mental health illness, so I, I, I experience that. And even in the front range, there's um, problems with mental health parity and availability of, of resources, and, and it's certainly on the agenda. Hello, my name is Tara Tillman. I am currently the dental services director for a public health dental clinic in northern Larimer County. I'm interloping up here. Um, it's a state work best. And I actually, please don't throw any fruit at me, but I actually was a worker bee at Medicaid during expansion. Um, I, I'm one of the people, and many of my friends are the people who get paid less than public school teachers to put these benefits together and try to get them up and running with very little money, support, or understanding from the executive branch up through the governor's office. And I left after a while to go run a public health clinic that uses the benefit I had just created so I could live with my own work product. We're not perfect. And now that I'm on the provider side of it, representing nine providers, we're not perfect. But, and I could go into any one of those bullet points for eight hours, and we won't. Two really big takeaways I have personally Creating a benefit and fixing the coverage conundrum doesn't equal access, so I just want to play off of some of those other people that have mentioned that. And one really big takeaway that doesn't even affect my clinic personally, because we only see uninsured or those on Medicaid if you have commercial coverage or can't, can't see you, but Medicaid as secondary needs to be addressed. Providers do not believe that they can collect from the primary when someone carries Medicaid as secondary. And last I checked, the AG has been asked to make a ruling on this or run some legislation to fix this conundrum. So I see a lot of tilted heads. You don't hear about it much until you're trying to get someone who has Medicaid as secondary some access. And it's hands off. The data is not there because it's not going to show up in Medicaid's claim system. So you can be Medicaid enrolled, taking other Medicaid clients, and these folks, you're, there's not going to be data that shows they're falling in the cracks. So if you worry about it, it's not dental specific. All providers have this concern across the spectrum. And I feel like after last legislative session, where I pretty much my understanding was anything with a fiscal note 50,000 or more was then on arrival, I'm guessing something like this would have had no fiscal impact and yet increase our access to care. So it's just hopefully maybe something that's out there. Could you just explain what Medicaid is secondary? Is? Yeah, so they do have some other kind of primary coverage, whether it's medical, dental, what have you. And if you have Anthem, you can still land with Medicaid as secondary, especially through the Affordable Care Act. But also we see it with a lot of children who through divorce settlements and the second parents. Like, so there's Medicaid in there. It, it, to me, it's a regulatory issue that could be fixed. Uh, so that's that's one that, um, like I said, it's not about my clinic now. It's more for being a Medicaid worker bee, and I couldn't get my bosses to listen to me. So you're here. <laughs> Thank you. The other big thing for me really is workforce development and understanding the stressors that the providers are under. The providers who are going to see, you know, the average person on the average salary, not someone who has the Cadillac plan. Their, their salaries are going down. My dentists are sure taking below what they could make in private or commercial practice. Um, and their student loans are ridiculously high. So I know that there are some loan repayments programs through the state. They could be better. They could help more. In another previous life, I worked on workforce development in Anschutz. There is not enough connections between elementary, middle, high school, undergrad, um, even community colleges and our health professional schools. We are, have a brain drain to other states who are offering the kids that we are trying to get here and to go back to serve their own underserved communities. We're losing them to all the other states because our, I know you probably don't want to hear this, but because higher education is bleeding to death, they don't have the money to give those kids the um, financial leg up they need to get. And it is a cycle. And I've, been, I've spent at least 20 years of my career in nonprofit work in academia, 
and now the public health sector trying to address it from every angle I know I can. And I know it's going to take more than a village. It's going to take armies and villages. Thank you for what you're doing. I wanted to provide at least one concrete takeaway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Bob Shutt, and I'm a physician surgeon. Actually, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and, and for 10 years I was actually chair of the orthopedic surgery department at Texas Tech, where I was a subspecialist doing pediatric orthopedics, club feet, dislocated hips, CP, and scoliosis. And anyway, I am also the candidate for House District 61. I'm running against Millie Hamner. And I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, for any other reason. And House District 61 encompasses Summit County and four other counties. And I happen to live in Gunnison County. And I'm on the staff at a small rural critical care access hospital in Gunnison County. Let me tell you, the hospital administrator stays up at night, is worried about his job, his budget, and barely makes evening things. It's not bail, who, whatever it is, bail down. And it, it's a problem, and a lot of the charges that occur in the hospital are associated with trying to keep it afloat and where you cut costs and what you do. Any, anyway, I care about people. I care that everyone has access to health care, regardless of what their social economic status is. That's a tough problem in this com uh, country, and in Colorado, too. And the expansion of Medicaid did help solve some of those issues quite a bit. However, it created some other issues. Uh, in fact, the budget this last year and the legislature was, I think, $350 million over what was allocated for health care. So the way the budget works in the state and the budget committee is they have to make it balanced. So the money came out of K-12 education, which is just as important to me as health care. It came out of transportation, which in this district, your access to your economy has got to be transportation from the front range. So some of that took cuts too. So there's things that trade off. Um, from my perspective as a provider, um, six years ago, one out of 10 people had Medicaid and we could afford to take care of all comers <coughs> without a problem. And when that was the case, you know, you, you humanitarian, you took care of everybody, but every time you take care of a Medicaid patient in a private office, you lose money. It doesn't cover your overhead. The data out of, uh, out of the state last year is one out of every four people in Gunnison County, and I'm sure it's maybe worse in Lake and Summit, both in the same district. Uh, the five counties that I'm involved in include Lake, Gunnison, here, Pitkin, and Delta. Um, one out of four patients, in, uh, people in your county is on Medicaid. With those kinds of numbers, we had two quality providers who have been in the community over 12 to 15 years leave Gunnison County last year because they could not make a living. And, and uh, as far as specialty care goes, you know, we refer to Grand Junction, we refer elsewhere, but we do not have a pediatrician in the county at all, and we are needing a pediatrician badly. We do not have an internal medicine doctor in the committee in the county at all. We have a group of family practice doctors, and one of those was the ones that left last year. So all of these make access to special care in these rural areas very difficult. This District 61 is so different than the Front Range because they don't face the same problems. They can go to the medical school or, or somewhere, but we don't have those areas. So. Um, I don't want to say too much because it's been a long meeting, but I am happy to hang around and talk to you about questions from a provider point of view, running an office. Uh, I am concerned that recruitment to these rural areas of quality physicians is going to be hard, really hard. So. My name is Vince Emmer. I come from Gypsum. Just a couple of quick points. I want you to think big. As you're going about this, you know, um, average healthcare. Uh, you're familiar with these numbers, I'm sure. But average healthcare costs in the country are 25,000 bucks per family per year. 
You know that Western Europe's doing about half that? Rich countries with no measurable differences. And um, Singapore's doing about 25% of the cost, 4% of GDP, right to 17.5 here. With a pretty interesting system. Um, we had $100 trillion in unfunded liabilities. Most of that's healthcare related. Congressional Budget Office shows us bankrupt unless something changes with a generation. This is a, a big, big issue from a macro perspective. Um, you know, we, I think we know that insurance companies can't control costs. It's easier for them to raise premiums than it is to cut back on coverage. Um, employers can't seem to get a handle on it. They can't control costs. Providers don't really have an interest in it um, for obvious reasons. Uh, government can't seem to do it if you look at Obamacare and how that got passed. So I'd like to suggest that uh, set your sights high, 50% cost reductions, 75% cost reductions ought to be able to ought to be within our sights. And um, I don't think we're going to do it with uh, good intentions and a magic wand. It's going to take real work. Thanks. Okay, so, uh, I think I can do it out of my view. Um, can you hear me? Um, so I'm, well, so I'm, um, I'm Tom Randall. Um, I'm with Mind Springs Health, the uh, Community Mental Health Center. And um, I actually live in Steve Hope Springs. Um, you guys are having a meeting in this area. But uh, we represent this in the 10th County, or this whole 10th County area. Northwest corner is where Mind Springs Health is, Community Mental Health. I do have a couple comments, and they reflect a lot of the same things that other people are saying, but I think this young lady kind of pointed out that it's even worse for mental health folks mm -hmm. in certain ways. Um, in 2008, I believe it was, the federal government passed a parity law. Mm -hmm. They said you had to cover mental health. It's never been enacted. Yeah. It's a law, but nobody bought it. Um, and I think there's a history in Colorado where Colorado has said, we're going to do it anyway. With depression, private depression is covered in Colorado. So if you're diagnosed with depression, and then the insurance companies have to cover that. Um, what I was really a great believer in the ACA. Um, what I, I know, Medicaid expansion was fabulous for us in a sense, and because we saw thousands of people in our 10 counties anyway, because of pent up demand. We finally got some, got some ability to come in and we saw thousands more patients. What the ACA did do, which we all had a fantasy it would do, was it, it left the middle class out. And I think that's part of this is the Parity Act. And if we can get that Parity Act passed, at least for my people, the ones that I'm most concerned about, at least they can come in and know that their health insurance is supposed to cover those diagnoses. The biggest problem we have is, is that high deductible right now. Um, I've got people that come in, they have insurance, and and then we have we have theoretically we're not supposed to put them on our um, low income plan because they have insurance, but they got ten thousand dollars they got to spend before they start to use the insurance. So and once you spend ten thousand dollars on my mental health for me, I'm hoping you're cured. Um, so I'm hoping we're doing a good enough job that you can actually get out of there for two or three thousand dollars if that's what it really is. Um, and maybe a little more if you have a lot of psychiatry and all those things. So now, there's just some things, and I think there's some history. Colorado could maybe go ahead and implement the Equality Law, even though the rest of the country has not, um, and, and get some of that stuff covered. Um, the, the, well, the deductibles, and then I have a couple of radical ideas. I'm no longer talking to somebody from uh, Mind Springs Health. This is Tom's stupidity here. But um, um, I think, obviously, if we're going to change what it costs, to do medical care in the United States, which clearly we're very, very high compared to other places, what this other gentleman just pointed out, is somebody has to make less money. I mean, that's just a fact. And that's why nothing's happening, because the doctors aren't going, oh, I'll do that. And the insurance companies, my, my choice is the insurance companies, but that's, you know, that's for someone else to decide. But I also think that um, I've had two surgeries in my life, and um, I would have ended up paying a ton more for those if my wife wasn't such a bulldog with insurance companies. And, and again, I think there's some history in Colorado where we tell insurance companies a little more about what we'd like for them to do. Now we see some of them pulling out, that's fact. But I think that insurance companies should get fined if, if they say no to your, to your bill the first time, and then five, six, seven, eight, twenty thousand calls later, they say, oh yeah, you're right, it's covered. Then they should get fined for that. Some, they should have to pay some percentage of it. Because all they just, as someone else mentioned it, they think you're going to not bother with it, and then they, they make several thousand dollars. If, if they actually cost them to put you through that hell to go through that, to get, a, get something that clearly is covered, then they should have to get fined or something should have to come back to, 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 the, to the person who's paying the premiums. So I'll stop there. But well, I guess, some, and Sarah actually said some other things, but we actually, um, we do have mental health here that if you walk through the door and forget that you have insurance and actually can demonstrate to us um, 
and we don't try to publicize this, but the fact is, is we know they have a $10,000 deductible, then what, we slide all the way to zero. Our scale will slide to zero, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll give you the care that you need. Um, and then it's against the law for us once we know they have insurance to charge them anything else other than our full price until they can get that insurance covered. So that's a big problem for those folks. We have to figure those things out. But, that's, but I hope you guys can have some help with Thanks. Thank you. I just wanted to say two people now have talked about parity. Colorado, as I understand it, is involved um, right now and over the next 18 months in terms of really um, looking at parity implementation and making that as much of a reality as possible. There's a mental health parity coalition that's sort of the provider and advocacy side working on it. So um, I'm not saying that's, I'm, I'm saying it because there's action and I think you should know so that you can be involved. Yeah. My name is Michael Mueller. Um, I'm new, essentially, to Summit County. We moved here a year and a half ago. I'm a practicing attorney in employee benefits. Um, we spent the last three to four years advising employers on compliance with the Affordable Care Act. Um, I, too, am a big supporter of the Affordable Care Act because of the expansion of health care that it has provided. Um, when I walked in here, laying out there mm -hmm. on the table was this publication. Okay? I assume it's yours. It's, it's the Center for Improving Value in Healthcare. Okay. Yep. And the, you know, when it says a hip joint replacement statewide average is 28.8, and in some county it's fifty-six thousand two hundred and fifty dollars, mm -hmm. you have the information that you need. There is abusive administrative costs associated in predominantly the hospital areas. The Stephen Brill article, Stephen Brill book that you talked about, you wrote an article in the New York, in, in Time Magazine that laid it all out. The hospitals have artificial reimbursement manuals that they base their charges on that bear no relationship to cost. It is what the it's what the market will bear, and the market is rigged. Okay, if you had subpoena power, I hope you had subpoena power. I wish you had subpoena power because you could subpoena the people that are responsible for the fifty-six thousand two hundred and fifty dollar charge and ask them to detail why it's $56,000 in Summit County and $28,800 in statewide. And I wish the administrators of St. Anthony's were here to explain it. Um, I had a colonoscopy here and, you know, the, and received excellent care, but I got a bill for $2,200 for the an anesthesia. One person that talked, I had one person talk to me before I went into the room, and I had another person administer the anesthesia, and each of them billed $1,100. Fortunately, my insurance company, through a negotiated rate, paid them $150 each. Okay, so why are, you know, where's that coming from? Okay, the problem is uncontrolled costs. And I agree with a single payer system, that could be reined in. Because, you know, we, you, know, you, have, you have the payor and they're, they're gonna make you justify your costs. Okay, so I would urge this committee to get the transparency it needs to get to the bottom of why these nonprofit hospitals are charging the rates that they're charging. And um, I would, you know, there's been some talk about the vote in November. It'd be great if we had a single payer system in Colorado. I don't think it can work on one state basis. I, you know, 
if for no other reason, why wouldn't everybody in the country come to Colorado <laughs> and get care? Okay? They will. So they will. They will. They will. And so, but um, no, just, I would urge you to to call out the providers and particularly the, the hospitals and ask them to justify the costs that they're charging. And you know the profit that, that has been demonstrated here, I mean, that is the reason why we're here today. You have to take the profit out of the healthcare system. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Thomas Davidson. I'm one of the county commissioners here in Summit County, and I want to start by uh, speaking on behalf of my fellow commissioner, Dan Gibbs. Uh, he couldn't be here today. He very much wanted to be here, but he's in Washington, D.C., testifying on behalf of uh, public lands. Um, on a nice day in the summer, to have this many people from the mountains come out and sit for two hours means something. And it means that something is really wrong. Um, this isn't a small problem. This is a really big problem. And, and if anything, I want you guys to have a sense of urgency as you go back and report to the state with regards to what's going on here. We have rising numbers of people that aren't insured. It is the opposite of what the Affordable Care Act was supposed to do. People in these communities up here aren't accustomed to taking handouts. We don't have large numbers of people up here that are on aid, uh, basic assistance or anything else. In fact, in Summit County, I know the average person works 1.3 jobs. 1.3 jobs on average. They're willing to work and work hard for what they get. It is so very difficult for people up here to think that they have to pay penalties to the IRS or that they have to go to the community care clinic and ask for a handout. It's hard on the psyche of the kind of people that live up here. And so the thing that I want to impress upon you as much as I possibly can is that this is urgent. I want you to express to the state the urgency of what needs to change up here. Um, it is not something that we want to take the next two to three to four years to try to tinker with. It is something that needs to change and change now. If you think about how many people up here live right on the edge, and the fact that there is another 20% increase coming in health insurance costs, we're going to have a huge number of people in this mountain area showing up at our FQHC. And we as Summit County government are doing the same thing that Lake County government is doing. We're pumping a lot more money into our clinic. And I'm anticipating that we're going to have to do it again next year. I serve as a trustee of the Summit Foundation, which is the community foundation for Summit County. We are pumping, as a Summit Foundation, a lot more money into the community care clinic, trying to keep them afloat. And it's concerning to us as we look at their budget, and boy, if you want to find a successful nonprofit, yes, the care clinic is doing a very good job of being a nonprofit. And so, please, 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 as you go back, I realize that there are significant, very well paid, very well funded interests when it comes to health care. I realize they have very powerful lobbyists. And I realize that right now, whether you're a hospital or whether you're an insurance company, you're probably liking the way that this system was set up in Colorado. But it's my opinion that it was not set up, that the ACA was not set up in Colorado to be fair at all to people that live up here in the mountain communities. And 
And we're not a group of people. We're not a community in this state that look for lots of handouts. That's, that's not who we are. Um, we work hard. We work a lot of hours. And, and this is just this is very, very painful for so many people what is happening to them. And you need to take that message back to the state. And you need to impress upon them that they need to do something quickly. Quickly. Thank you. stops today. So the commissioners are available. Contact information is on the website. Their meetings um, are accessible via ReadyTalk. Um, all the information can be found on this website. This presentation, along with all the other data and presentations that the commissioners have seen at their previous meetings, is all available on the website. Um, and so we hope this conversation will continue. You can sign up for uh, informational alerts from the commission on the website, um, as well as submit comments. So please access this, use it. Um, the commission thanks you for your time, and I'll let them. Um, What's ready talk? Ready talk is a way to access online and through the phone the meeting. That are you have to have that kind of phone? No, no, you no, have no, to have no. access to the internet. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to thank all of you for coming out today and, and to, to emphasize, as Johanna just said, we would encourage your engagement and involvement in our meetings. You can access our agendas, all of the previous information, the input that we're seeing. We have our, our recommendations that are building and going up on, on the website now. Um, by, by accessing through ReadyTalk, you'll be able to see in real time what it is that we're looking at and what we're talking about. You'll have audio, you'll be able to hear through our microphones so that you'll be able to, to hear the information that's going on. We really, really try to maximize uh, public input in this way. So that is, a, that is a service that we really encourage you to take, it, take part in and get involved in because you'll help keep us on track if we're going in the right direction or not. Uh, you know, I just, uh, on, on a personal level, want to take a moment to thank all of you for coming out here. Um, I do not represent a special interest uh, in the healthcare delivery system. I feel very strongly about what is happening like all of you. My kids are going to inherit this system. It is time that we get it right and, and really do appreciate all of the time that you've taken to come and, and talk with us today. So I don't know if anybody else would like to add anything. I certainly would encourage you to do so if you would like. But, yeah. Thank you. And I'm, I have to use this. So uh, I hope you can hear me. My name is Marcy Morrison, as you can see, and uh, there was a gentleman there that uh, recognized me as the former insurance commissioner of two times back. <laughs> but I, I would like to share with you, I, I mean, I truly took to heart what I heard because I have heard it for a number of years as insurance commissioner and as a legislator, and I cannot Thank you enough for showing up today because it's only people like you who make your message available to us and to legislators and county commissioners and others who are in elected positions uh, or who are ambitious to get there for some reason or other. I don't know why, but seriously, I spent eight years there, so I can say that. But seriously speaking, uh, I want to make a couple of comments. One, the insurance division, which is a regulatory agency, one of, one of the uh, re regulatory agencies within the department um, of DORA, we do take phone calls. We, uh, at least when I was there, and I'm sure the system has not changed, there are people who are technically very competent to take someone who, for instance, gets a $20,000 bill, doesn't understand it, wants to find out more about it from their insurance company, and they will actually take your, your complaint. Usually, it's, nowadays, it's easier to email them 
but they also take it by phone. And they will go back and track that question for you. And we did it all the time. So the state really does play a part, and they play a part, the department plays a part, only if they hear from you. And then they send that up. You know, I used to get those reports as to how many people were calling about issues concerning Aetna or concerning Kaiser or concerning Anthem. And we did find them. We found, in many cases, we did find that they were inappropriately doing something and they were fined a, a healthy amount. Maybe not as much as you would like to see, but healthy amount. But my point is this, you, I think the citizens of Colorado, in my own opinion, as a private citizen now, as a private citizen, you all are going to make the difference whether anything does happen in Colorado. We as a commission can do the best work we can, and this is a fabulous group to be on. And we've got dozens and dozens of studies, and we have fine people researching for us. But frankly, it is every one of you who get to your elected officials and make your concerns known to the insurance companies and the hospitals and your own physicians. And they, in many cases, don't know where to go either. My own doctor asked me, I remember when I was the insurance commissioner, well, who do I complain to? I have all this paperwork and it's driving me crazy. <laughs> so I said, have you talked to your insurance company about what you're having to do? Oh, I hadn't thought of it. Well, she said, I didn't think I, I could do that. That's what she said. Mm -hmm. Many people in the Many of the citizens are so frustrated at this point, they don't know where to turn, turn to, and how to and how to do it. It's really pretty simple. You've got a computer, you know your legislators, you know your, your people who are elected, especially in the rural communities you do. I live in a small community, I can pick up my phone and talk to my mayor. Mm -hmm. They cannot give you the answer, but they should be able to start sending messages up the chain of command. And I would suggest you all do that. Start sending messages up the chain of command and let yourself be heard. My only other second point, having been in a couple of public roles now, is the answers. It reminds me of a starburst. There are so many pieces to health care. So many pieces. And each has a legitimate role. You want a good doctor, you want the doctor to be paid, you want the doctor or the nurse or the physician's assistant to be paid, you want good service, you want it quickly. You have, I mean, we just go on and on and on. We do need to take hold of the system and shaking it up perhaps is not the right approach, but taking it piece by piece may not be the right approach either, and that is what you need to think about whether you want to shake up the whole system or you want to incrementally change it. And that's something that we as a commission are going to have to, we're challenged with that particular problem as well. Do we look at it piece by piece or do we offer, as someone said in the back, that we have to look at the really big picture? And that's what's making me stay up at night and think about. Thank you. Well, I too, I want to thank everybody. And, um, you know, I'm here as a provider. So um, it, there's different perspectives. I like to call it there's, there's many P's. You know, I'm a provider, but I'm also a patient. I'm also a parent. There's also payers involved. There's politicians involved. Um, so we have to look at this from all those different views. And we all share that, because you're all probably some of those as well. And we put up that list before of all the different areas. And, and as Marcy was saying, uh, healthcare is very complex, and, and that's not an excuse. I mean, it's just that we have to, we all need to look at all the pieces, because when you push on one piece, then it affects another piece. And so, you know, we need to look at the effect on providers in rural health or front range. That's what's fascinating to me. We, we focused a lot on the financing, but we also have to look at delivery models, which I'm very interested in. Who's providing it? Workforce is very interesting, uh, important to me. 
and how are we using different members of the healthcare um, workforce? And are there ways to have incentives, whether it's through payment or loan repayment or others, to get other people involved? So, and I just want everybody to know that we're, it's very complex. We have to look at all the issues, and the more we hear from different people helps us. And, um, and I thank you for all your input. Thanks. I was on the right here. We were at Grand Junction last night, and I stopped on the way at Palisades to have a conversation with one of my patients in Denver um, whose father is uh, having memory problems. It touches on every single one of the stories that we have here where um, how do you help make a decision that is the best thing for that person, that best for that human being? How do we make a decision that's best for that human being? It turns out also is the best for our health care for our economy. I think when we take our stories that you have today to help us uh, with the stories that we've looked at, it's going to only help us. When you look at Denver, sitting and looking at those numbers here, it's different. When your commissioner comes down and talks about that, what I've heard here today is the real crisis um, from the folks around here around the table. So my job as a family doctor is to take the best care of my patient economically, but mostly for that human being. I think those are the same. Um, if we take better care for our people, we have better outcomes, and it ultimately ends up costing less. Thank you for sharing your stories today. And we'll take your stories as we go uh, forward towards our deliberations. I can't say it any better than that, so I, I won't. But yeah, we appreciate your passion. We really do. And, um, you know, I, I, I sense your pain in a lot of areas, and it's not anything we're going to take lightly. I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you.